Our speaker today is Chelsea Kwong, pro-choice YQL board member, speaking on abortion as health care. What does pro-choice mean? So please welcoming, welcome Chelsea. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, like Kristen said, I'm a board member for Pro-Choice YQL. Um, Jen was supposed to be doing the speaking today, but she is unfortunately ill, so I have filled in last minute. Um, so I'm going to try and do a good job of her presentation um, and answer as many questions as I can. So just a little bit about Pro-Choice YQL. So um, Pro-Choice YQL is a Southern Alberta organization. We believe in the right for everyone to access supportive, informed, sexual and reproductive health care. Um, all of our resources are gender neutral. We work to provide culturally informed health care resources as well as referrals. Our goal is to empower individuals in Southern Alberta with the knowledge and resources necessary to make informed choices about their reproductive health and sexual wellness. I can. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so we're dedicated to advocating for access to safe and legal abortion services, contraception, as well as comprehensive sexual education. Our vision is a future where reproductive justice is a reality for all. We firmly believe that every person in Southern Alberta deserves the reproductive care they require, free from judgment, discrimination, and stigma. Um, we're committed to building a more equitable and inclusive future by championing the rights of individuals to make decisions about their own bodies and lives. We aim to foster a community where reproductive health care is readily accessible and celebrated as a fundamental component of overall health and well-being. Uh, one of the big things that Pro-Choice YQL does is uh, provide education for our community. So we offer sexual health, safer sex, and reproductive health care workshops for groups, organizations, classes, um, and agencies large and small. We follow educational best practices in our approach to safer sex and reproductive health care discourse. Um, all our workshops are custom built depending on the audience, the organizational need, and time, and all the workshops do contain information on medical abortion health care, information on how to access medical and surgical abortion health in Canada or in Alberta, safer sex education, and then sexual health care myth, myth busting, as well as reproductive health care access in Canada. So lots of good stuff that we do. Um, this past summer, so in summer of 2023, Pro-Choice YQL actually sent out a survey to um, its members, stakeholder organizations, um, email lists um, in our community, and we did a survey to understand what our community understands about abortion health care. Uh, so the survey was 12 sections, with each section act acting, asking about a different aspect of sexual, reproductive, and abortion health care. They were a mix of different methods to try and capture as much information as possible. So we had 100 people fill out the survey. Um, these were all people who filled it out voluntarily. And we gained some really good insights um, to try and help guide the work that we do, as well as our approach to ensuring informed and comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care. So, so I'm going to kind of show you some of the results of that surveyed, um, and I hope that you'll find that interesting. Okay, so one of the first questions we had was, as far as you are aware, do you know anyone who's had an abortion? And 88.9% of people said yes, a firm yes, that they did know someone. So that's quite common. I mean, if we say about 90% of people, that's um, 9 in 10 people who know someone who's had an abortion. That's not that they know of someone who knows someone, but they actually know someone who's had an abortion. So um, it is more common than we might think because it's something that we don't talk about a lot. Um, the next question that we posed was, I know enough about the healthcare options for safely terminating a pregnancy. So while about 62% of people did agree with this, there's still about 40% of people who didn't know about the healthcare options. So that's where Pro-Choice YQL comes in. Um, when you contact them, you'll be given really good information about where to go for um, healthcare options, whether you want a surgical abortion, you want a medical abortion, you just want somebody to talk to, because um, about 40% of people who responded to this didn't know where to get that information. Uh, the next question we asked was, I am confident that I can access health care, or uh, that I can access abortion health care if I choose to. So only 50% of people said that they agreed with that, um, which is important because I think if we posed any other type of health care up there, probably closer to 100% of people would say that they knew 
where to access that. So if we had, you know, I'm confident that I can access cancer care if I choose to, um, that I could access diabetes care if I choose to, we'd see a much different number. So the fact that only 50% of people um, agreed with that is, I think, pretty important. Another very important question is, I trust that my doctor would discuss abortion healthcare options available to me if I asked. So again, while well, 50% of people felt that they could discuss that with their, their doctor, 50% of people didn't feel like they could confidently do that. And again, if we put in any other type of healthcare in there, you'd hope that it would be closer to 100%, right? Um, so the fact that this is a genuine part of people's healthcare that they're feeling they can't discuss with their physician, um, that's pretty, pretty informative to me. Uh, so th this question here, we said, how would you prefer to access a prescription for medication abortion? Um, so they ranked it from their first choice to their last choice. Um, so if you look at the blue bar, that's um, what people ranked as their first choice most often. So most often, they want an in-person appointment with a doctor or a nurse practitioner at a clinic in their community. So they want to see someone one-on-one -on -one, um, in their community. They want to be able to go to their clinic and access those services. Um, if they couldn't do that, a virtual telehealth appointment um, would be acceptable. That's something that you could maybe do in the comfort of your own home. Um, and then lastly, um, people would choose at an abortion or sexual health clinic, even if it required travel outside of your community. Uh, so one of the things that I thought of when I was looking at this chart was that there are some people who picked that as their first choice. And the question that I had was, do those people not feel safe going to an in-person appointment, or do they not feel safe accessing um, a virtual telehealth appointment in their own home? Um, is that why they're choosing to go somewhere outside of their community? Uh, because they don't feel like they can safely get that within their community. So we also had kind of an open-ended question, and we just asked, what other barriers, if any, would be of concern to you when attempting to access abortion health care? Uh, so one of the first things here is the pharmacist not filling the script for the abortion pill out of their beliefs. Uh, so I, myself, am actually a pharmacist, so I found this uh, really, really affected me because I think somebody who's chosen to um, you know, visit their physician to get a prescription for this has already had to make a really tough decision, and now they're going to a pharmacy and they're faced with judgment again somewhere in a pharmacy, which is a much more public place too. So um, that's really concerning that, uh, that people are thinking of that um, when they're thinking about abortion health care. Also, somebody said that they were not sure where to go and who to talk to because of judgment. Uh, so again, any other part of healthcare, are you worried about people judging you if you, you know, need information on, on diabetes or hypertension, anything like that? Um, if you did, that would be really scary because you wouldn't be getting the care that you needed. They also said the lack of doctors in the community taking patients then willing to prescribe, and then the limited amount of pharmacies that will dispense the abortion pill. Um, you know, your, your access gets smaller and smaller and smaller. First you have to find a doctor, then you have to find one who's going to prescribe it, then you have to find a pharmacy to go to. So um, a lot of barriers to face. They also said um, geographical. So there's a lack of clinics and practitioners in Lethbridge and Southern Alberta. Uh, fortunately, pro-choice YQL has um, broadened that over the time that they've been around. They've actually gotten a lot more practitioners um, who are prescribing for um, medical abortion. So it has gotten better, but it's still not great. <laughs> Um, as well, ideological. So the fear of going into a clinic that's religiously based and will not provide accurate information or a full range of options. Um, as well, uh, a few people talked about being gender non-conforming and facing discrimination or harassment from medical professionals um, or the people at the clinic, as well as a lack of knowledge in how to support those people. Also, someone mentioned that, um, you know, sometimes when we're talking about abortion and sexual health, we're talking about women's health, but um, that's maybe not always the case for people who are someone who's transmasculine, they don't often get read as female, um, and they're trying to access these types of services, um, even though they do still have a uterus and ovaries, but maybe it's a bit harder for them because they um, don't get read as female. 
So um, lots of things that came up in this open-ended question. Um, so this is a little bit of a kind of a, a busy chart, but, um, but kind of the most important takeaway from here. So which of the following, if any, would be of the most concern to you when considering pregnancy options? So the thing that most people chose was um, actually judgment. So judgment from healthcare, judgment from the community, um, and then as well, um, 42 people shared that, yeah, that judgment from the community was most important. Lack of resources was the second most concerning factor. And then privacy and safety were also very strong considerations and concerns. So what we can see from this is that everyone has their own reasons for terminating a pregnancy, but often our reasons share similar concerns. So privacy, safety, capacity, and resources were really strong factor factors in decision making. Um, the things that weren't really strong factors were religious or moral beliefs. Um, so 94% of people, that wasn't a strong concern for them. Okay, so um, kind of the, the last section of our survey was um, talking about what misconceptions that there were about access to abortion health care in southern Alberta. So one of the biggest concerns that we have is how people are given information about reproductive health care. Um, this is something that I didn't know a whole lot about until I was more involved with Pro-Choice YQL. Um, so they asked the question, pregnancy care or crisis centers in Alberta provide information on the full range of pregnancy options, including referrals for abortion health care. So there's still 30% of people who think that that's true. Um, luckily, 66% of people um, know that that's false. So in case you were like me and didn't know this, uh, pregnancy crisis centers are really not good places to get comprehensive information about pregnancy or pregnancy termination. They don't refer out to public health care agencies, and they're not connected to most social service agencies. Um, oftentimes, they're funded by Christian churches, and this means that they're not accountable to the communities that they operate in. Most importantly, pregnancy crisis centers, some of them have provided misleading and incorrect information to people who are looking for genuine support. They have been recorded to provide false ultrasound reports telling patients that they're past the eligibility for abortion or causing shame. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are some places that do some good stuff, but um, in general, there are a lot of them who aren't providing the full range of information that um, somebody looking for pregnancy information might need. Okay, so the next misconception that we had. Um, so the cost for surgical abortion is fully covered under Alberta healthcare. So 64% of people agreed. 35% um, of people thought it was false. Um, fortunately, because we live in Alberta, it is uh, true. So the cost for surgical abortion is fully funded by Alberta Health Care, um, if you choose that. Uh, the next question, the cost for Mifigamizo, which is the abortion pill, is fully covered under Alberta Health Care. So 42% of people said this was true, 57 said it was false. Um, so it is actually very true. So um, I work at one of the pharmacies that dispenses Mifigamizo. It's 100% covered for Albertans. Um, as long as you reside in Alberta, you can get this medication. Um, as many times as you need to. It's fully covered, you don't have to pay um, a single cent for it. All right, the, the next one that we had was, in Alberta, a doctor's referral is needed to get a surgical abortion procedure. Um, so 60% of people thought this was true. Um, I also thought that this was true. I figured you'd have to talk to your doctor to get a referral for that, but um, actually in Alberta, any person can self-refer and they can book with a few places. So the Kensington Clinic in Calgary, the Edmonton Women's Health Options, or the Peter Lougheed Women's Health Clinic. So three options, not a whole lot of options, but we do have some options, um, and you don't need to go through your doctor, so you can self-refer to those um, and are able to access those services. Again, free of charge. And the next one that we had here was, in Alberta, youth under the age of 18 need parental consent to have a medication abortion. So about 60% of people thought that that was true. Uh, but actually in Alberta, anyone under 18 could be considered a mature minor. Um, so if they meet the criteria for mature minor and they require an abortion, 
um, they can get one safely without their parent or guardian's knowledge, um, and that would be both surgical and medical abortion. Um, so someone who's a mature minor is someone who um, is deemed to understand the, the risks and benefits of the procedure and um, can safely go ahead with it. All right, so I kind of sped through that. I haven't done those before. <laughs> um, so I guess we just wanted to say th thank you for letting us present here today. Um, we're able to provide the support the way we do because of the support that we have in the community. Um, abortion healthcare, it's been in practice for as long as pregnancy has been happening. There's a long, long history of this. It's not shameful, and most importantly, it's very safe. Um, Pro-Choice by QL works with doctors throughout Alberta that provide medic medical abortion, and we're super grateful for their support. Um, Jen and other board members do a lot of education with healthcare providers, um, which I think really gives them the confidence that they need to, to provide this service in Southern Alberta. Um, just another stat, so since February of 2022, uh, we have connected with 194 individuals. Um, some of them need referrals, some of them just need information, and some people just need support. Um, they just wanna know their options and how to, to um, get information if they need to. Um, but most importantly, they needed someone to talk to without judgment um, and to be able to do that safely. So I'm really glad that Pro-Choice was there to be that person for them. So Jen also said that people here were gonna wanna know what, what they could do to help with this. So she said people often ask us this question about how they can help. Um, and she said the biggest thing, first and foremost, is just to be there as a support. So like we saw in that first um, question, you know, 90% of people know someone who's accessed an abortion. So if you're someone who can be um, supportive, someone that somebody could come talk to when they're navigating how to access the healthcare that they need, um, that's pretty important. Uh, the second thing that she mentioned was just to ask your doctor or your clinic if they do prescribe Mifigamizo. If they say yes, thank them, and then ask them to contact Pro-Choice YQL so that we can add them to our list of prescribers. Um, and then if they say no, just ask them why. Maybe share with them why you as a patient think that this is something important that they could be providing for our community. Um, and then as well, she said, stay in touch. So we do have a 24-hour volunteer uh, phone line. So um, it's on kind of all our social media and our website and everything like that. So anytime that somebody needs, they can call. Somebody's going to answer the phone. Um, our website is on here, um, as well as our email. Um, there'll be a link to donate on that website, too, which is a, a great thing to do. Um, but yeah, if you do have any other questions or you need to get in touch with someone, um, someone will always get back to you right away. They're always super, super good at that. All right, so that's all I have. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Chelsea. As a unique weekly opportunity for people to discuss ideas and issues, SACPA is supported in many ways by the community. First, thank you so much to LSEO. They provide this room free of charge. Thank you for patronizing their lunch counter. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. Thank you to the Lethbridge Herald, Stephanie for being here, and other media for their coverage and support. And thanks to Rogers TV for recording our sessions. They are always available both on Shaw, Spotlight TV, and SACPA.ca archives. So again, if everyone could just give Chelsea some love, thank you so much for your um, amazing presentation. And now it is time for our question and answers. You know the drill. So for those that are wanting to ask questions, please line up against the wall. The rules are as follows. As follow, please state your name and your question briefly. <laughs> no long preludes or stories. I'm just reading off the paper. <laughs> um, we respect, we expect respectful and polite discourse. If you prefer to write your question, um, I will be able, if I can read it, please use legibly written and I will do that as the moderator. So. If we could, if anybody has any questions, please line up here and Chelsea will be here to answer and I will be hovering in the back. Thank you, our first one's coming up. Hi Chelsea, Hi. my name is Henning Mundell and I actually have two questions, one with a little preamble. 
um, you've, it's not a big crowd, and we're very early. You're correct. Um, I would like to a bit more information about the nature of the survey, whether the people were self-selected, whether somehow what kind of randomness was used, to what extent was it just women, to what extent uh, were also men asked. I know you're, as I'd say, persons, but it's mainly, it's only ladies that uh, uh, actually have abortions, although men have, of course, an interest in what's going on with their partner, uh, and probably not very men, uh, many men uh, in life can say that uh, I, I, as I have experienced, it's sort of a different story, to actually be a patient on the maternity ward at the birth of a daughter in Kenya. That's happened to me, it was a broken leg. But uh, other than that, okay, so the nature of the survey and selection of gender and people, and the other one is, Right now, probably today, in the next few days, in the US, the Texas decision has gone to the US Supreme Court about the medical, the medicine for abortion. If the Supreme Court accepts the pe uh, Texas uh, regulation, there'll be no more medical abortion legal in the US. Mm -hmm. In the US, it's gone to the US Supreme Court. All right, so um, I did ask Jen that same question about the survey this morning because I also had the same question. Um, from what she told me, it was sent to stakeholders, so other community groups. Um, it was posted on the website, um, posted on social media, um, shared widely. So it was people self-selecting. I don't know if they um, did record the, the gender of the people who um, were answering the questions. Um, but I will say that I know that you said that maybe men don't experience um, these sorts of things, but um, it takes two to tango. So, you know, when a person is going through abortion, their partner is also going through um, some of the same, same things, has to make the same decisions, um, and can be very involved. So um, there is also that consideration as well. Um, and then the second question, yeah, I agree with you. It's really scary that that went to the Supreme Court. Um, hoping the Supreme Court will uh, side with, you know, the FDA who approved this medication that's been approved for a very long time. Um, luckily, Canada is separate from them, so even if it is for some reason struck down by the US, it'll still be available in Canada um, and other places in the world. So I know there are a lot of places in the States where people are like ordering these medications online to come from, um, I think there's a big organization like Germany that does like mail order of this medication. So I think people will still be accessing it. It won't be as safely for them and it won't, it won't be as widely available. Um, but yeah, it is scary that something like that happens. And I mean, there's um, other medical ways of doing abortions that aren't as effective and aren't as safe. So um, I would imagine if, if they do strike down this decision that um, there'll be more unsafe abortions happening, which is not good for anyone. <laughs> six inches. <laughs> uh, my name is Carol Sakia. Um, <clears throat> so in the case of the person under 18, what's the process to ensure that, you know, they, they are mature for their age and that kind of thing? I'm not against it. I'm just wanting to know the process by which that's determined. And also, what's the local experience or do you know um, of... Um, medical abortions being performed here in Lethbridge and the staff who may be declined from participating. Mm -hmm. It's going back up, Chelsea. <laughs> Perfect. So I actually had the same question as you, so I looked up right before I came here, the um, Alberta Health Services actually has a summary sheet on consent to treatment or procedures for minors or mature minors. Um, so it says, 
Uh, a patient under the age of 18 is presumed to be a minor patient without capacity unless they've been deemed to be a mature minor. So a mature minor is someone who can understand and appreciate the nature, risks, and consequences of a proposed treatment or procedure and can provide consent without the input of their legal representative. Um, from what I understood of this, this would be like a decision between a, a physician and the patient. Um, they do have a lot of like how you can assess it. So it's, it mentions age, but it says age alone will not determine their capacity. It mentions intelligence, maturity, um, the serious healthcare related decision. So the importance, uh, the importance, intrusiveness, and complexity and seriousness of the procedure. Um, and then if they can provide informed consent, and then if they're free from parental or guardian control, if they're self-supporting, if they're married or they have children. Um, so, so there is lots of guidance for Alberta Health Services. Um, I would imagine if you can't make a decision, then I'm sure there's somebody that you could refer to in Alberta Health Services who would um, help you make a legal decision on that. But, um, but there is lots of guidance in Alberta for that. Um, and then uh, the second question that you had about the local experience. So. There are local providers who will provide prescriptions for uh, medical abortion for people to do at home. Um, as far as surgical abortions, they aren't really happening in Lethbridge as far as I'm aware. Um, A, because we don't have many uh, OBGYNs and they're not available very often in Lethbridge because there are so few of them. Um, and yeah, I, what I understood from that was that the, the culture around providing something like that wasn't really positive in Lethbridge, so a lot of them did not perform those procedures. Uh, so many people do have to go out of the city for them. Um, that's hopefully changing. We are getting some uh, more doctors coming in, some uh, doctors from other cities who are wanting to perform these procedures. So uh, hopefully in the future that will be an option for, for residents of south, south of Calgary, anywhere south of Calgary. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your presentation, Stephanie. My name is Terry Shillington, and I have a couple of questions. One is, uh, I guess the landscape has changed around abortion with the advent of the, the uh, medical option. I'm curious about the percentages uh, in Alberta or in Canada, if you know what percentage of abortions now are being done medically and how many uh, surgically. And secondly, this is probably a dumb question, but I, it wouldn't be the first one I've asked. Uh, the initial is YQL. What do they stand for? Oh, that's the airport code for Lethbridge. <laughs> okay. What's that got to do with abortion? <laughs> Just, I guess, Lethbridge area. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Obsessed. <laughs> um, as far as the numbers of medical versus surgical, um, I don't know that. I could probably find out that information. Um, if you want to give me your email after, I can find that information for you. Um, I guess it depends how easy access is and where you live, probably. Um, I think most people here, if they aren't able or aren't willing to travel, then they do choose the medical option. Um, I know the stats for most people who um, do choose to do an abortion are doing it early enough that medical is an option for them. So most abortions are happening, you know, pre 10 weeks um, of conception. So they're able to do a medical one. Um, as far as like the procedure itself, um, a medical one, yes, is nice because you can do it at home and it's easily ex more easily accessible here. Um, there are some side effects with it though. It can be um, painful for some people. Um, so it, they do have to think about that. Um, a surgical one, um, you know, you have to go to a facility for it, but um, it does tend to be uh, less painful, although more invasive. So um, people have to make decisions on that. But, but yeah, I don't know the exact percentage. I would like to know that too, though. Thank you. Uh, my name's Ian Hurdle. I'll give you the number for the states. 52% uh, uh, do medical abortions in the states. So that's the current number. Um, anyway, um, in 1900, 4% of the women giving birth in Alberta died. Our current rate is five or six women a year in Alberta, and the rate is about one five hundredth what it was. The numbers in the states, if you're white, is twice the number in Canada. 
if you're black, it's four times the death rate of what we have in Canada. So uh, my feeling uh, or a problem that I see is if you've ever been around somebody who has had an induced abortion that's not medical and seen that person die, to me, it's a little bit like watching a kid die of leukemia in front of you. It really pulls at your heartstrings and you never want to see it again. So the birth is not without its risks. A, the risk for a surgical abortion is about one thirteenth what giving birth is. And for a medical abortion, the risk is about one fortieth. So my question is, why do we want to put these young women at further risk and take away their choice? <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. Like, um, you're right, there's, there's risk to this. Like, we can't just go into it thinking that, like, the best option is to have a baby. Um, like, yes, there's risk to it. Um, there's also risks, um, you know, to women's education. People who might be forced to have a child n not at the right time for them um, are maybe not going to seek the education that they might have. Uh, they're not going to make as much money and their children are going to be worse off uh, because of that. Whereas if they're able to make a choice, um, to be able to give birth at the right time for them, it does lead to better outcomes for, for the woman and for her future family as well. So I fully agree with you about that. <laughs> My name is Mark Gettle. So before I ask a question, I'll just say a little bit of a story regarding minors. When my daughter was 16 years of age, she had her tongue pierced. I was furious. How could somebody pierce the tongue of my daughter without my permission? I made inquiries, and I was told that courts have ruled that minors as young as 14 years of age have the right to make choices about their health without their parents' consent. So that was that. And then Terry took my question away, so I'll just add another one. Is, do you have statistics of how many abortions are, are uh, routinely produced in Alberta on a yearly basis? Uh, approximately, yeah. I don't know. Again, I don't. That would have been great information to bring with me. Um, yeah, I don't know if that information is like routinely collected. Um, I guess as far as like being a pharmacist, that we could look at how often uh, like Mifigite Miso is, is dispensed. Um, I know at our pharmacy, I will tell you that we get at least a few prescriptions a week. So that's at our one pharmacy in Lethbridge. So. Um, I would say we average maybe three to five a week um, would be an average. So that's in Lethbridge, if you can extrapolate that to the, the rest of the province. Um, and like we said in that first question, like 90% of people know someone who's had an abortion. So um, it is maybe more common than we, than we think it is. Good morning, thank you for your presentation. My name is David Amies. I don't really have a question, but I would just like to recount a very brief story. I had a life-changing experience when I was an intern in a hospital in the East End of London a very long time ago. And a woman came into the emergency department. She'd obviously got what we call an acute abdomen. There was something wrong, she needed surgery. The surgery was duly carried out and it was found that her abdomen was full of all kinds of noxious things. She had obviously been to a backstreet abortionist. This happened very regularly in those days because there was no option. It seems that women have found ways, not always very good ways, of bringing um, a pregnancy to an end, and that's usually brought about by desperation. And so really to deny abortion and forcing people to use the services of some backstreet practitioner, and I use that word quite advisedly, it seems to me to be quite immoral and really extraordinarily cruel. Yeah, I fully agree with you. <laughs> I, I, I feel like there's a saying that says like, um, like uh, making abortion not legal doesn't get rid of abortion, it just gets rid of safe abortion, um, which is very true. Uh, 
yeah, I mean, we've all heard stories of, like, like we said, it's been happening as long as women have been having babies, or as long as people have been having babies, they've been having abortions as well, whether it was with, you know, herbs and um, different stuff like that. Um, Everyone's heard of like coat hanger abortions. Like it's been happening as long as people have been having babies. So, yeah, being able to make it safe and and accessible, it's like we said, it is part of healthcare, um, and it should be made safe, um, especially in this day and age when it is available to be safe. And um, yeah, so I agree with you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Ken Sears. Um, the question I have is, well, I've got a couple of questions, but you, you ref I wasn't aware of the, of the possibility of self-referral. Mm -hmm. um, I'm relatively aware of a lot of things, I think. <laughs> well, at least I talk like I am. But <clears throat> if I'm not aware of it, it seems to me that a lot of, particularly younger women, women from disadvantaged situations, will be even less aware of the possibility of self-referral. And even if you're self-referring, where do they refer to? How, you know, you, you mentioned Lougheed and Cal one place in Calgary, one place in Edmonton. If that's it for the province, I can guarantee you that some young woman from Raymond is not going to know that those even exist. So what tactics, and it's not just for you, for everybody here, what, what ways can we increase the knowledge of those possibilities out there in the community for people who need it. Yeah, I think that's like one of the really big things that uh, Pro-Choice YQL does. Um, so Jen goes around, she puts pamphlets everywhere that she can um, with this information. Um, you know, you, got, you all being here, um, having this information now, you can share it with others as well. Um, but yeah, I even think, so, you know, you're right, like somebody from Raymond or somebody from Medicine Hat, if they have to go to the Kensington Clinic and they don't have the money to get there, um, luckily Pro-Choice YQL provides um, help with transportation, um, help with an, like an overnight stay if they need to, uh, because you're right, it's still not super accessible. Um, but that's what we're trying to get more of. So we're hoping that being out in the community doing things like this um, does take down those barriers. Um, unfortunately, there's still lots of barriers in place, but we're working on it. We're trying to make it better. Um, yeah, and like we said, with the support of, of people like you all in this room, uh, we can do more of that. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying. <laughs> Chelsea, <clears throat> I really enjoyed that. I mean, well, it's not great news, I guess, but uh, not a great thing to talk about, but very nice. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Violet Meekma. <laughs> and uh, yes, thank you. It, it was very informative. I learned some things for sure. And maybe you can clear up something else for me um, as to what exactly a pharmacist can prescribe without the doctor's prescription. Now, I think the morning after pill possibly, but I just wonder if you could clarify for me what a pharmacist can currently do. And in, is there any reason why pharmacists could not prescribe the other medical abortion pills? And do you know of any places where that is done, like in Canada, is there any hope that that might be something in the future? people can access. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so in Alberta, pharmacists who have their additional prescribing authority can uh, prescribe all Schedule One drugs, which is basically all the drugs except like narcotic or controlled. Um, so pharmacists can prescribe uh, contraceptives, um, which can be very helpful. Um, Plan B is available without a prescription, so it is available for self-selection for people to get on their own, but we do have people lots of times coming to the pharmacy asking about that as well. Um, and it is covered on some drug plans, so sometimes if they do come to us, we can help them with coverage for that. Um, I guess technically they could prescribe for Mifigimizo. Um I would find it hard myself um, to pro provide that service at a pharmacy because I just don't feel like that's the right place for it. Um, I think there a lot more goes into the prescribing of it. Like you want to make sure that the person has a safe home, a safe place to be d taking this medication at. Um, 
like when I tell people about the medication at the pharmacy, I tell them, you know, if you have too much bleeding or if you have signs of infection that you need to go to a hospital. But I think if they were getting that from a physician, it would be, they'd already have that relationship. So they, it might be a little bit easier for them. So I don't know that being in a pharmacy is the best place for someone to be prescribed that medication. Um, that being said, if they're, was a situation where, um, you know, I'm thinking of places where there is no physicians or there's small towns and maybe there is a pharmacist there who wants to provide that. I think if you had um, a good, like, interprofessional relationship with a physician and we're kind of um, working together to provide a service like that, um, that would be a little bit better. Luckily, in, in Lethbridge here, we do have quite a few prescribers. So if somebody does um, need a prescription, they're often able to reach someone quite quickly. Um, you know, same day, next day, like, pre pretty quickly they're able to, to access someone. But um, I, yeah, I think legally if ph like pharmacists could prescribe that medication, but I don't know that it would be the best idea um, to be doing that in a pharmacy, just because I want them to have um, a little bit more support, and a little bit more healthcare available to them. Hello, my name is uh, Knut Peterson. Last time SACPA dealt directly with the, with the issue of abortion, we had an overflow crowd. We couldn't fit everybody in. <coughs> That's about more, more than 10 years ago. And in the earlier days, they, you know, they, they had walked down the streets against abortion. It seems to me nowadays it's more it's not as big a public issue, for sure. Who are the main people pushing? There's still people pushing back, of course. So could you explain to me who are the main people pushing back? Is it pro-life? Uh, is it religious organizations? And like personally, I think uh, like you can both you can be pro-life and pro-choice at the same time. Um, could you explain what the, who are the main pushback? And th politically speaking, there's some political parties that can actually make hay out of uh, being against abortion. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, explain who might be against uh, uh, sure. pushing back? Yeah, so like as far as I'm aware, um, the people who push back against this are people who turn it into a moral decision. Um, people who are thinking of this as a healthcare decision, um, like like we said, it's it's a safe option um, if done correctly. It's it's very safe for women. So um, so I don't think it's people who are like in healthcare saying that this is unsafe. Um, I think it's more people who are turning it into a moral decision, um, who are putting that onto other people. Um, yeah, so, I mean, what I'm getting at is it's probably like <laughs> religious organizations that are um, a little bit against this. There is um, some information about, like, I can't remember which organization it is, but one of them had asked, like, all the MPs in Canada, um, are you pro-choice or, like, do you support um, abortion health care? Um, and most of the people who were conservative, I believe, were not pro-choice. Um, so politically, that's where people are at. Um, yeah, so that's as far as I know on that. <laughs> Hi, my name is David Major. Um, I don't have any experience with abortion. So I wonder, or, or any of my relatives but, uh, that I know of, but I'm wondering, uh, regardless of judgment in the, or, or anything, are there any after effects for young women who take the, the morning after pill or medical abortion or surgical abortion? Like, how does that affect their, their mental health? And if, it, there are, are, if there are adverse effects, is there any place they can go for help? All right, so, um, so physically there is 
like basically zero risk to, to doing an, an abortion. So, I mean, there is always a small risk with like a surgical abortion or a medical abortion of things like infection or things like um, uh, too much bleeding, that sort of thing. Um, but they're very, very small. Um, as far as like affecting future fertility, um, there is no effect on future fertility. Um, as far as affecting their uh, mental health, um, from all the stats that I've seen, um, a woman being able to choose to get an abortion is actually better for her mental health than having to go through with a pregnancy that she um, did not want to have. Um, and most times that is more harmful than being able to choose an abortion. Um, most, like overwhelmingly, most people who choose an abortion do not have any regrets. Um, like overwhelmingly amount, I'm gonna say it's like high 90% of people. Um, but I mean, I guess if you did, um, if you did uh, need help with that, there, there are just general mental health supports in Alberta. Um, if you needed to contact Pro-Choice YQL, I'm sure we could put you in touch with um, some mental health supports for, for issues like that as well. I have a question. Um, Kristen, hello. My question is, what is the relationship like between our pregnancy crisis center in Lethbridge and pro-choice YQL? Uh, I do not think there is a relationship as far as I am aware. Um, but like I said, I've only been a board member since the summer. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that there is any relationship at all. Uh, Maybe Chantelle or Jen would be a better person to ask about that, but um, yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm not aware of one. Sorry, Kristen. <laughs> and just for everyone, just as we are wrapping up, thank you so much for your attendance. Thank you for your questions. Um, is there any takeaway message that you would like to leave the attendees before we carry on with our day? Oh, just kidding. <laughs> Carol Sakia, what's your funding source for Lethbridge YQL? You did mention something about uh, donating, but what is, is there a funding source? Uh -huh. So we do get lots of community donations. Um, there are people who do like monthly donations or lump sum donations. Um, some of the positions, um, like Jen's position, is funded by a wage grant. So the government of Alberta, or government of Canada, I think it's Women and Gender Equality Grant. Uh, so, and we do apply for some grant funding to provide, um, like educational services and that sort of thing. Um, funding like that can't go towards things like helping with transportation or helping with costs of hotel rooms. So lots of that comes from. Um, just fundraising and um, like community donations for stuff like that. But yeah, lots of the educational stuff is funded as well by grants. Not that I'm aware of, but um, yeah, Jen or Chantel, the president would be more aware of. I'm, I don't believe there is any funding from Alberta Health, so. I believe so, yes. <laughs> take away time. Oh, take away. <laughs> Yeah, my takeaway, I guess, is that um, everyone here is very, very supportive and very inclusive. And um, I think if more people knew how maybe supportive people are, um, it would be better. So if you are able to be vocal about your support for um, abortion and healthcare and sexual and reproductive healthcare in Alberta, um, I think if you voice it, you might, you know, if you help one person, that's super awesome. If you give one person information, they might be able to pass it on to someone else. So um, just being supportive and, and offering support to people uh, is very helpful. And I think that everyone in this room can do that. Thank you again for everyone in attendance. Our next SACPA session is in the new year. It's Thursday, January 4th on the topic of Indigenous recovery, building allies in the community. So I just wanted to wish everyone a happy holiday, Merry Christmas, whatever you celebrate, stay warm, stay safe. And if we could just, again, please thank Chelsea for doing an incredible job with her presentation. Thank you.